three. Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought. And today, boy, oh boy, oh boy, am I excited because I get to introduce to you my good friend. And it's like, it's hard not to call him my favorite astronaut. I love Dr. Don. It's like, I have so many favorites, but let me say this, Hoot is my one of my favorite Tennessee astronauts. His wife is great. So I am really hard blessed to call you my favorite because I do, I think you're wonderful, but I have a lot of astronaut friends as I know you do as well. So Hoot is gonna share with us all things amazing. I will tell you that Hoot's been pretty great. He has given me literally a lapel pin from every one of his space shuttle missions. So. I pre feel pretty special over here on my planet. Uh, but everybody get settled in, write your questions down. And Hoot, good morning. How are you? Oh, good morning, Janet. I'm doing great. Happy to be with you. Oh, that you've got a ton of kiddos online that want to hear all about what it's like to be an astronaut. I've told them a little bit about you, but feel free to tell your entire story, sir. Okay, all right, good. Well, I'll, I'll rattle through these slides then, uh, is what I, I figured we would like to see. And the first slide sure. was a picture that we took on my final mission to space, and it's while I was docked with the Russian space station Mir. And so we actually went over into the Mir and took this photo of Atlantis over uh, Turkey. Turkey is to the left part of the picture, and we're over the Black Sea in that photo. Well, how did I get to be an astronaut? Well, uh, I was lucky. I grew up in a flying family. This is a picture of mom and dad. And what's kind of cool is this is not dad's airplane. This is mom's airplane. Uh, my mother and two of her girlfriends from college decided they were going to learn to fly. So they went out and bought this J2 Taylor Cub. And that's how she met my dad, which is kind of similar to the way I met my wife in the astronaut program. But as a result, I grew up with flying. And so I have lots of pictures like this one of my biggie brother, John, and I playing at an airport. <laughs> my dad was managing up in Cooperstown, New York, which is where I was born. And so my dad's the one who taught me to fly. And this is a picture when I was about 16 years old. Uh, he taught me to fly. And I'm proud of saying if I have done well as an aviator, uh, it's because my dad was the one that taught me how to fly. So out of college, right into the Navy, went through pilot training. Of course, you start all over again, learning how to fly the military way. And this was a photo taken right after my first solo flight in a jet airplane, which was a very exciting day for me. Way back in 1969 was wow. when I flew my first solo in a jet. And this was an exciting day as well. This was my first carrier landing in a Navy trainer jet. And uh, when you go to the carrier for the first time, you don't have an instructor with you. You are kicked out of the nest and you are really on your own. And that was another very exciting day. Well, then from there, I joined. Could, could I ask you one question? Can you go back to that uh, landing on that carrier? Is that just a scary moment? Uh, I mean, I know you've practiced for that. You've gone all over the flight training, but describe for everybody how that feels to because your plane has to also grab something because there's there's water if you miss right on the other side. Yes. And as you can see in this photo, actually, you make two what we call touch and go landings on the carrier before you drop your hook. In this picture, you'll see my hook is down. Uh, you can just barely see it towards the back of the airplane hanging down and you're gonna grab one of those three cables. I think you can see the three cables across the carrier deck. It isn't scary, it's unforgettable uh, because you've never been so close to an aircraft carrier before and the whole giant carrier is moving through the water. It isn't holding still. It was funny, my brother asked me, hey, when you first go to try it, do they hold the carrier still so that you don't have to land on a moving carrier? No, it actually helps you to have the carrier moving because that creates more wind and you're flying through the wind so it slows down your closure rate on the carrier. So it's actually helpful to have, to have the carrier moving. And 
Janet, as you mentioned, we had trained so much on the airfield and to the right side of this image, you can see a man standing there. That's your landing signal officer. He has personally trained each one of us. He wow. knows what we're good at, what we're not good at. He knows where to watch us, how to correct us if we need any correction. So you have trained so thoroughly for it that it isn't scary at all. It's oh, just plain exciting. And so, <laughs> right, uh, I, I got my first choice out of pilot training, which was F-4 Phantoms off the West Coast. And golly, flying a supersonic jet from a carrier is such a thrill because you go from this, pre this presentation, this picture, to this one in about three seconds, and you're going 175 miles an hour when you get to this position. So it is exciting. It's the fastest acceleration that you will experience anywhere. There's not a Corvette or a Porsche on Earth that'll come close to it. So really exciting. And uh, my, that was my first fighter jet that I flew. Then I flew in the Navy's very first F-14 Tomcat squadron. If we saw the movie Top Gun, mm -hmm. this is the airplane that Tom Cruise was allegedly flying in the movie. Uh, and I always say, Tom Cruise, eat your heart out. I actually got to fly these. <laughs> what an exciting airplane that was. Everything the Phantom could do, the Tomcat did about 15 to 20% better. Accelerated faster, turned better, climbed faster, had a much more sophisticated radar and navigation system on board. And one of the big features was the swing wing. In this picture, the wing is swept fully forward. And this was one of the few airplanes in history that had a variable sweep wing. And then for high-speed flight, we'd sweep the wings aft, which made it look really cool. It was really <laughs> a cool-looking airplane. Now, that wasn't the purpose of it. It was to make it a more efficient airplane. And so that's one picture with the wings swept aft. Uh, here's another picture coming back into San Diego. Uh, two Tomcats, obviously, in formation uh, with the wings swept fully aft. And it made it more maneuverable. It was easier to fly formation on with the wing swept aft. And so frequently we would do that just because it was it was more convenient. And, and then when it was- Talk to people if they're not familiar with some not, um, aeronautical or aerospace terms, you know, it's kind of like being in, in a boat and maybe even mention those four forces of flight. Yes, well, the four forces of flight, of course you have the weight of the airplane, and that has to be overcome by lift, the lift coming from the wings and the body itself. Sometimes the body produces a significant amount of lift. And so those two forces have to be in balance for you to stay at a constant altitude or you'll, you'll let weight become greater to descend, you'll let lift become greater to climb. And then there's a certain amount of drag. Anything moving through the air is going to generate drag that tends to slow you down. So therefore the engines have to be putting out a great amount of thrust to overcome that drag. So you have lift, you have weight, you have thrust taking you forward and you have drag wanting to retard you. And so those are the four forces that you, the pilot, have to be constantly managing uh, to successfully have an airplane in flight. So uh, glad you pointed that out, Janet. That was a, a good thing to talk about. And now you'll notice in this image, when it was time to come back to that giant, huge aircraft carrier, the wings are back forward again because we want to be as slow as possible to land on the carrier. But from up here, you'll notice that carrier doesn't look so big. And this is the USS Enterprise, the world's first nuclear powered aircraft carrier and it's over a thousand feet long but when you look at it from up here you have a tendency to say to yourself i'm going to land on that tiny thing and well yes most of the time you'd better uh, because frequently we're operating in the middle of the ocean and there's no airfields nearby for you to land on now having said that the tomcat was really a nice airplane around the carrier because of that great big giant wing and you can see in this image, it's spread to full, uh, full sweep. 
and full forward sweep, I should say. Once again, you'll see the tail hook sticking down uh, below the F-14 Tomcat on approach to the carrier. And so it made a very good airplane around the boat. Now here's the view you have. Once again, you would tend to say, oh my gosh, I'm gonna land on that tiny thing and I'm gonna stop in that short a distance. Well, yes, you'd better. And in this photo, you'll notice there are four cables on the big carriers. The, the photo I showed you earlier was the USS Lexington, which was a very small carrier. It only had three cables. In this one, there are four cables. Once again, to the left side of the picture, you'll see our landing signal officers who are there to help coach you if you need it, uh, to wave you off if the deck's not clear yet and that sort of thing. But you'll notice this is some very demanding flying because there's not a whole lot of room on the left side. There's people over there and airplanes. There's not a lot of room on the right side. There's people and airplanes there. So it is some very demanding flying to fly to and from an aircraft carrier out at sea. And once again, here's just about to touch down. This was actually my airplane, number 114. The number on the nose, 114, uh, had my name on the front cockpit. And my, my Rio, my radar intercept officer, the backseater was not a pilot. Uh, he or she was a radar operator. Radar intercept officer is what they were called. So Rio is what they were known as. So you had a two person crew uh, operating this jet fighter uh, to be as efficient as possible. Well, then I got to do this. Okay, so it was this background in aviation and also background in aeronautical engineering, uh, which was my major in college uh, that got me selected to be an astronaut in 1978 with the first space shuttle class of astronauts selected. And this was really exciting to be one of the lucky few selected because we had not selected astronauts in nine years previously. So this generated a lot of interest in the media because for the first time we had women astronauts, my future wife, uh, Margaret Ray Seddon, although she goes by Ray, Dr. Ray Seddon was one of the first six women astronauts selected. And ever since that selection, we have selected women and we have also selected African Americans for the first time, uh, beginning in 1978, and then every opportunity since then. So it has been a very all inclusive uh, program. And many, many sorts of people could go to space uh, with the space shuttles and now continuing with the International Space Station. But this was my space shuttle, my first space shuttle, Challenger, the night before launch, way back in 1984. And here we are on our way to space. My first mission, we planned to launch on February the 3rd, 1984 at eight o'clock in the morning, and by golly, we did just that. We launched uh, on February the 3rd at eight o'clock in the morning, and this was a very exciting ride as well. I mentioned the catapult launch off the aircraft carrier. Well, this feels like a catapult launch, but instead of lasting for three seconds, it lasts for eight and a half minutes, and that's all the time it takes for us to lift off and accelerate to orbital speed, which is 17,500 miles an hour. So if you calculate that out, eight and a half minutes, we're accelerating it better than 2,000 miles an hour each minute going to space. So another very exciting ride. Well, one of the things that we did on my first flight was this. Now, this is not me, and I never got to go outside and do a spacewalk. Uh, I always say it's because we pilot astronauts are so valuable, we can't risk us outside. But <laughs> that's you not are so valuable. That's not Absolutely. really. That's not really the reason. Uh, the real reason is we would spend. We, the pilot astronauts, would spend so much time training on launch, reentry, landing, rendezvous, docking vehicle malfunction procedures, vehicle systems to even out the training time, the mission specialist got to do all the spacewalks. 
There were only five of us on my first mission. We sent two of them outside, Bruce McCandless and Bob Stewart. And no doubt you've seen this photo before and you've probably wondered who was the gifted photographer that took this photo? Well, I'm, I'm proud of saying that as the co-pilot on my first mission, I was not mission commander, I was pilot or co-pilot. I was the only person on the crew, what, that could work a camera? No, I was the only person on the crew that had absolutely nothing to do during the spacewalk. So I was parked at the window with a Hasselblad camera and I'll never forget looking through that camera viewfinder and saying to myself, oh my goodness, what an incredible image this is. If I don't mess this up, I'm going to get the cover of Aviation Week magazine. Well, I wound up with three covers of Aviation Week magazine. And this photo has become one of NASA's most widely used photos. Now, I'm happy I got to be a pilot astronaut because I got to be a mission commander four times. But when I looked out the window and saw this and this, I was really jealous. <laughs> Just picture the view. This is Bruce McCandless. Picture the view he has under his boots of the earth 180 miles under his feet. And he's moving across the earth at five miles per second. He's a human satellite. And he used a rocket backpack to fly away from us this was the world's first untethered spacewalk. Prior to this, every astronaut outside had at least one tether attaching him to the space vehicle. And this was the first time that any of this was done untethered. And it was a, a brilliant success, worked really absolutely great. And it was used on subsequent missions to rescue satellites and do things. Well, I'll, I'll fast forward to my final mission. And one of the things I like to say is after all those years of being a cold warrior as a Navy fighter pilot, training to shoot down Russian fighter pilots, in this photo, I'm sitting in between two Russian fighter pilots who had been training to shoot me down all those years as well. But together, we are going to do the first docking between the American Space Shuttle and the Russian Space Station Mir. And it's going to bring together former Cold War adversaries in a way that we've rarely done before. So these were the 10 of us, three of them, the three to the left side of the photo launched in March of 1995 on a Russian rocket and went to the Russian space station. The rest of us launched aboard Atlantis in June, towards the end of June, 1995. Now, one of the fascinating things for my crew and I was that we went to Russia twice to train before the mission. And so we got to be tourists to some degree. So we got to go here to Red Square and see, golly, this very beautiful St. Basil's Cathedral in the foreground. And this was really an experience to get to go see Russia ourselves. And here's three of my crew members and I, three of the Americans, uh, actually on Red Square with St. Basil's Cathedral in the background. We got to go to the Russian equivalent of our Air and Space Museum and see some really fabulous futuristic Russian aircraft that we had only seen very grainy, uh, photographs of and airplanes that we had no idea what they really were for. And we got to go experience this firsthand uh, during our training. This was a, um, not the best looking airplane I've ever seen, but it's a vehicle that the Russians call Bor-4, B-O-R-4, which in Russian would be Bezpilyotny Orbitalny Raketoplan Shatiri, which is pilotless orbital rocket plane number four. And this was a, a vehicle that the Russians flew in space unmanned and took it to orbit and then brought it back to land. You notice it lands on skids. It's not gonna win uh, a beautiful airplane contest anytime because it wasn't the prettiest thing you've ever seen, but it worked very well. And that was another one of the things we got to see. Well, here was our first view 
of the Russian space station Mir, Kosmichesky Stansi Mir. And Mir is a Russian word that has two meanings. It means world and it also means peace. And where I docked was in the upper right-hand corner of this picture in a docking port that the Russians had put on Mir intending to send their space shuttle to. Their space shuttle only flew one time late in 1988, unmanned, and it never went to the Mir space station. So what we did was we bought the portion of the docking adapter, which you can see in the front part of this picture in the shuttle, in the shuttle cargo bay, you can see a ring. It's about a four foot diameter ring. And what I had to do was fly Atlantis manually. So I'm flying by hand at this point and maneuver Atlantis up to where I line up the centers of those two docking rings. I had to line them up within three inches. So we are traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. The space station is as well. And I had to line up the centers within three inches. Now, fortunately, we had trained on this and I had done nearly a hundred dockings in the simulators. And the more you train, the luckier you get. So of course it went off without a hitch. And then the protocol was, the plan was when we got there, the two mission commanders are to shake hands at the hatch. And so in this photo, I'm shaking hands with Russian Air Force Colonel Vladimir Dejurov, who was the Mir commander. And the president of the United States stated that day that this handshake must mark the end of the Cold War. So I tell everyone, I'm the person who ended the Cold War by going to the Russian space station Mir. Well, you know, we stayed. It's really so powerful an image when we think about everything that's happening in the world right now, Hoot, this was truly a moment because it's like listening to you talk about you guys, you know, heretofore had been sworn enemies and now here you are shaking hands and welcoming each other in space. I think that's why I love it so much is that space tends to be this sort of like global uniner. Yes, it does. And the, and the more we got to know our Russian comrades, the more we grew to love them. And they got to be our good friends. The cosmonauts are just like us. They're just like American astronauts. They like to fly jet fighters. They like to pull Gs. They like to go to space. And it was so rewarding to see, and it shouldn't have been a big surprise to us, that humans are the same everywhere. And this really helped to reduce global tensions quite a bit, especially between the United States and Russia. Uh, we could use a little bit more of that nowadays, but it really was a wonderful thing. And to this day, we have been working with the Russians in space uh, aboard the International Space Station. Well, we got to stay docked with the Russians for five days and we actually did a Russian crew change out. So the three that had launched in March aboard the Russian rocket, came to the space shuttle and spent the rest of the mission with us. And we dropped off Anatoly Soloviev and Nikolai Budarin to take over the Mir station for four more months. And so this is the only time that we have done a Russian crew change out using an American spacecraft. It's the only time that has ever happened. So it really was a trailblazing mission. Well, we got to spend five days, and I'm almost to the end of the slides here, but we got to spend five days docked with Mir, and then we detached on the 4th of July, 1995, spent two more days getting ready to come back and land, and then this is what we would look like during re-entry, and this is a wind tunnel depiction of a space shuttle flying at this 40-degree nose-high attitude that we fly, and we create a powerful shock wave around the space shuttle during re-entry. And this is what we would see out the windows of the shuttle during the re-entry. It looks like we're flying into a blowtorch because we heat the outside air up to 9,000 degrees. And there's not a metal on earth that'll tolerate that. So the outside of the space shuttle 
is covered with thermal protection system. We refer to it as TPS, thermal protection system. And it's to <clears throat> protect the aluminum skin of the space shuttle from that heat of reentry. And then once we get down a little lower in the atmosphere, we're a glider. Here, the landing gear is going down. We hold the landing gear until we get down to 300 feet because it creates a bunch more drag when we put the gear down. And of course, I suppose you all know that we're a glider when we're coming back into land. We don't have any engines. So we get exactly one try to land the space shuttle. So we train very, very extensively for the landing. The commander will have had at least a thousand practice landings in our shuttle training aircraft, which we're gonna see in an image in just a moment. So he or she, have we ever had women space shuttle commanders? You bet we did. So women can do anything that men can do nowadays. They can be fighter pilots, test pilots, mission commanders, astronauts. Women can do anything that men can do. So we take over, the commander would take over manual control. So she would take the space shuttle manually at about 55,000 feet, fly it the rest of the way down to landing and touchdown would be at about 235 miles an hour on a heavyweight mission. And in this picture, the airplane that we see in the upper portion, that's the shuttle training airplane. It would chase us down on landing approach so that it could measure what the wind profile was as we were coming into land. So we could calculate how good our glide performance on the orbiter had been. And so that's the airplane that a mission commander would have at least a thousand landings in. A co-pilot on the shuttle would have had at least 500 landings, practice landings in that, in that shuttle training airplane prior to their first mission. And then, the last slide I was gonna show, if you've done everything right at the end of all that, you get to pose for hero photos in front of your space shuttle. So there were eight of us that actually came back to land aboard Atlantis. Three of them were the cosmonauts who had been up there for, for uh, four months in space. Only we put them into a wheelchair and into rehabilitation when they come back. So that's where they are. And then Dr. Ellen Baker, one of my mission specialists, a medical doctor, was helping with the three cosmonauts. So that's why there are only four of us available uh, to pose for this cool hero photo um, after the mission. So with that, those were, those were the slides I was gonna show us today. And uh, chances are those have raised a whole bunch of questions. And, Indeed, uh, they have. And, Let's see if if you can if you can see it and stop your share. Perfect. Uh, okay. Good. I tell you how we're going to do this, guys, because we've got about fifty four people here on the line. I'm going to go to kind of a big gallery view here and uh let's see here i'm going to just kind of come around you'll have to just raise your hand and let me know so lucas let me come to you first ask your question i know you jesse and top of swinney have said things in the chat if you've got something send me that chat if i don't happen to catch you catch your hand okay so lucas what's your question my dear it um it is what did um what did you eat on your Russian, on your Russian space mission for those five days? Okay, uh, Lucas, excellent question. Uh, now the food that we had aboard the space shuttle itself was very good. NASA had put a lot of effort into making the food very palatable, which means taste good, which made it made it very very enjoyable. Most of our food was dehydrated food. Those of you that are Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts have used dehydrated food because it's dried, it weighs less, you can carry it in in your backpack if you hike in to where you're camping. And then hydrate it, okay, big word, soak it in water to where it takes its normal form back again. That was the kind of food that we had 
uh, aboard the shuttle. Now, when we went to the Mir space station, we had a little celebration aboard the Mir the first night we were there. And the Russians opened up some of their favorite food for us, which we weren't crazy about. I have to admit, one of their favorite ones was something called beef aspect, which <laughs> is beef in gelatin, in a, a type of preservative gelatin. And they, they're really fond of it. We have to admit we weren't crazy about it, but we pretended like we enjoyed it. So it was the celebration that was important. And so we did try some of the Russian food as well. I think the Russians really enjoyed our food though. Great question, Lucas. Great question. All right, I'm gonna come over here to Jack who has, looks like, did you make your own um, my astronaut own box helmet for today? What are you doing? I made my own box for it. You made your own box. Okay, so it's your own like astronaut helmet. All right, I like it. Look at that. So what's your question for astronaut Hoot? So um, when you did go up into space, um, was it like, was uh, re-entry harder or uh, taking off? Well, um, Jack, great question. You know, both of them are very exciting. I get the question all the time says, what's the best part? Is it the launch? Is it being on orbit and the view? Or is it the re-entry and landing? Well, the launch happens much faster. It's only eight and a half minutes. And so if you have a malfunction during launch, you've got to fix it pretty rapidly or you're not going to make it to space. And it could be difficult not making it to space. Now, we never had that happen in the shuttle, but it was happening much faster. So I guess I'd say launch was more challenging on you. And of course, the acceleration was as much as three Gs, three times the force of gravity acting on you. And that tends to mash you back into your seat, moving your arms around to flip, flip switches and things could be a little more challenging. During the re-entry, we were just gliding back down. Now gliding back down through all that fire and flame was very exciting, but we would only be pulling two Gs, two times the force of gravity during re-entry. So I guess I'd say the one that was more stressful was the launch, uh, the trip to orbit. So yeah, great question, Jack, thank and you. All, and also if like, if like the, uh, if it didn't work and like the, um, and it didn't work if the um, if like you didn't flip a uh, an important switch, and you didn't get the launch correct. What would happen? Well, if you flip the wrong switches, you could wind up in the ocean. You could wind up killing your engines. And I have to admit, in the simulator one time, I flipped the switch incorrectly, and it shut down all the engines. And when that happens, the only place you're gonna go is into the Atlantic Ocean, which would probably kill the whole crew. So in training, I actually killed my whole crew. Fortunately, it was in the simulator, but that's why we do simulators is to learn and to make sure that in real flight, you're a whole lot more careful about what you're doing and you have learned what the mistakes could be. So yeah, a couple of great questions, Jack, thank you. All right, Jennifer, I see your uh, question. Where are you, J Jennifer? I am looking for you so I can unmute you. Uh, help me out here. Okay, I see you. So you wanna ask your question, Jennifer? Uh, all right, I'll ask it for you. So uh, it is, why did the cosmonauts have to go into rehabilitation? Okay, yeah, excellent question, Jennifer. Um, you have been weightless at that point for, in their case, for four months, okay? Now, they exercise very heavily every day. So they had things like treadmills or they had weight machines that they could pull weights, which were bungees really, because in weightlessness, a weight doesn't weigh anything. It still has mass, and if you get it moving, it still has inertia and momentum, but it doesn't have any weight. So the smallest, tiniest person can move something around that weighs 500 pounds because it has no weight. It still has all that mass. So they would exercise very heavily for two hours a day. However, you're weightless for 22 hours a day. And as a result, you don't climb stairs. 
Uh, you don't you don't have to support your weight against gravity. And as a result, your muscles atrophy. What does that mean? That means your muscles get weaker. And one of your muscles that gets weaker is your heart. We measured my heart using ultrasound before my first launch. And we measured it after eight days when I landed within three hours of landing and my heart had shrunk 7% in the Whoa. course of eight days. So your heart is one of the muscles in your body that you're just not using because you're not having to pump blood uphill to your brain against gravity. And you're not having to pump blood because you're exercising for the other 22 hours a day. So as a result, everything degrades, all of your muscles degrade. And one of the things you're at risk for when you first get back from being weightless for that long is back injuries because your back muscles degrade a lot and your back muscles help support your upper body against gravity. So that's why we put them into rehabilitation. It's very important so we can avoid injuries when you're first back on earth and readapting to gravity again. Great question. Great question. Great Jennifer. question. All right. So I've got a couple in the chat. I do recognize that. But uh, Dharma, where are you, my dear? Uh, I'm going to come to you. And I see you that down in South Africa. I see you, Ander. I'm just responding to some things that are coming. Dharma, I'm trying to find you. Uh, let's see, we got a bunch of people here online. All right, I'm going to unmute you now. Ask your question, Dharma. Okay. Um, what was your favorite thing that you've ever flown, like plane? Oh, golly, in the way of airplanes? Okay, Dharma, great question. If it isn't space shuttles, um, space shuttles were pretty favorite. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to top that mission. Um, now, I certainly enjoy jet fighters. They were a lot of fun. You talk about power. Man, with your throttles, you had so much thrust, you could climb straight up in a jet fighter. So I got to fly a number of jet fighters. Um, now, this is going to be a strange answer. Certainly, I enjoyed the F-4 Phantom that I flew in the Navy. And I certainly enjoyed the F-14 Tomcat even more uh, that I flew in the Navy. But one of my favorite jet fighters, again, strange answer, the Russian MiG-21. It is such a cool looking airplane. It has what's called a delta wing. The wing platform, when you look down on the wing from above, is in the shape of a Greek letter delta. And half of that airplane is engine, which means it has a lot of power for the weight of the airplane. And I used to fly it in air shows uh, up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and actually all over the United States, in California, oh golly, in uh, Oklahoma. And it was an exciting airplane to get to fly in an air show. Now it didn't have a lot of fuel in it and I would be using a lot of power in an air show. So for example, up at Oshkosh, Wisconsin in the big air show up there, I would do a six minute routine. Total time from takeoff to clearing the runway, six minutes, and I'd burn two thirds of the fuel that that airplane had. What? So a lot of power, a lot of energy, maybe not a whole lot of fuel, but really an exciting airplane. So that was a fun airplane to fly. And it was such a unique looking airplane. Great question, Dharma. Thank you all the way from South Africa. Well, and Dharma is, um, she's wanting to be a future astronaut. And I just sent her a book that mentions your wife, uh, Dr. Ray Seddon as a female astronaut, but she's wanting to be a pilot and an astronaut. So Dharma, just meet, meet your future here with astronaut Hoot Gibson. It's not, you'll be one someday. All right, I see tons and tons of questions coming through. I'm gonna try to do this guys. Let me put you up big like this. Uh, it's hard with so many of us to find all your names. So if you're gonna wanna ask a question, just let me know as I stream through here. So I'm gonna come to, uh, Rabada, I'm coming to you, my dear. What is your question? My name is not, um, that's my mom name. My name is Isa. Well, hi there. What's your question? My question is, um, um, since, since people say we could live on Mars, why, why people, why people say we could live on Mars? Is it like they have, 
um, Mars have the futures, like some futures that Earth have? Well, we, you know what, one of the reasons is just it's built into our DNA, Isa. It's like, we sort of like, you know, it's kind of like when uh, the first explorers like Magellan said, hmm, I wonder what's on the other side of that water. I wonder if there's anything. Let's go find out. Or when the first settlers that went out west, hey, the east coast of this country is pretty great. Wonder what's on the west side of it. I think it's built in our DNA to explore. Um, it'll take a long time for us to live on Mars and make it habitable. But for us wanting to go to Mars, it's just an ex extension, I think, of wanting to explore. What do you say, astronaut Hoot? I, I agree completely, Janet. And, and the other side of it, too, is we'd like to study Mars to see, did it once support life? Was there any form of life? We believe we see channels where water liquid water had flowed in the past. Mars appears to be pretty much of a dead planet now. What can we learn from Mars that might help us with the Earth? So there are lots of things out there for us to learn. And exploring Mars is one of those really exciting challenges that uh, maybe some of you are gonna get to do. All right, Andrew, you've had your hand up. So Andrew, Victoria, uh, Hannah and Max, I'm coming to your question, Melinda. Jenna, oh, Jenna is one of my former like acting students. One of her students, uh, oh yes, he got, we got him. All right, so Ander, we're coming to you. Hi. Hi, Ander. Hi. Scoot back uh, a little bit so we can see your face. <laughs> there we go. Um. So my first question is um, sort of like, what was like being in orbit like for you? Okay, great question. What was being in orbit like? Well, um, let me ask you, do we climb stairs when we're up in orbit? Do we have to walk anywhere we go? How do we get around? You just push off with your fingertip? Yes, exactly. We fly everywhere we go. Could you picture doing that down here on the Earth? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be wonderful if we could just fly everywhere that we go? Well, that's what being in orbit is like. You can fly. You can hover in midair. It is the most wonderful thing. So not only do we get to enjoy this gorgeous view of the Earth, but being weightless and being able to fly is something that you just never forget. So great question. Great question. All right. Coming to Seth and William down in Cape Town. What's your questions, fellas? Have you ever fi found any fossils on any planets or moons? Well, uh, the answer is, great question. The answer is I haven't been to the moon. Um, I joined the space program well after the moon missions had been done. Now the astronauts that went there, we had 12 Americans that walked on the moon. That would be one of the things they would have been searching for. Now we really didn't expect that we would find fossils on the moon, but that would certainly be one of the things that we would be looking for on Mars. Any evidence of, of fossils of even bacteria anything left over from bacteria or any kind of microorganisms or things, that would be one of the things that we'll be searching for on Mars. So I, I never went to the moon, so I didn't get to personally do it, but it's the sort of thing that we would be exploring and looking for. Great question. Thank you guys. I'm gonna read off a few things just so that I make sure we get to, cause some of them are really fantastic. So I'm gonna ask you, I'll, I'll give you the top three that are coming through. Uh, Melinda Benson, who's, who's on the line and she's a teacher. She flew in the Royal Air Force. Uh, she wants to know, can you talk oh, a, little yeah, bit about, a little bit about teamwork? I'll come back to you guys in just a minute. Let me mute you there guys. Um, it, and then, um, she wants to know about teamwork, if you can talk about that. And then the other thing we want uh, to hear from you about is, was there ever somebody you didn't get along with? That was another question. And third question, what does space smell like? 
Well, okay, uh, great questions. Well, teamwork, one of the questions, when I speak to a large group of people, which I'm doing right now, um, I'll ask them this question. I'll say, okay, can one person fly a space shuttle all by himself? Answer is absolutely not. Can one person operate the International Space Station all by herself? Absolutely not. It takes a team of people to do this. It takes a team on board the space vehicle. It takes a great team in mission control. It takes a great team that train us to do all the things that we're going to do in space, in the simulators and in classroom study and all of those things. So it is a gigantic team. One person is not gonna do it by herself. One person is not gonna do it by himself. So it takes a whole lot of teamwork and training. Now, let's see, the third question was personalities. Was there anyone that you didn't get along with? No, I have to say I got along with all of my fellow crewmates uh, very well, extremely well. And part of it is, you know, your own individual attitude. If you if you had somebody, and I've had people that I worked with in the past that demanded that we do it their way. It had to be her way or it had to be his way. Those people aren't gonna do very well in our space program. And one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to when we select astronauts is, is this person a team player? That's what I always said when I was chief astronaut briefing the selection board, saying we are looking for team players. We're looking for people that can work together as a team. And then let's see, her middle question was, What does space smell like? Oh, what does it smell like? Well, um, <laughs> outside would not smell like anything because there's no air out there. And, and you wouldn't want to try to sniff the vacuum. Um, because that would be fatal. And so you can't do that. Now, the spacecraft itself smells like whatever you, the crew, make it smell like. And we actually, before we would re enter and land, we would clean up. We would go around with wet wipes and clean up the vehicle because we didn't want to bring back a dirty vehicle. And what would happen is not, not anything real dirty, but occasionally you'd have a a drink container with coffee in it and you'd lose one or two little dots of coffee and it would it would make a spot on one of the panels. Well, we'd go clean all that up. So it really didn't smell bad because one of the things we were doing was the atmosphere was constantly being refreshed inside the space vehicle. We were filtering out carbon dioxide, which we humans produce when we exhale and we were adding nitrogen and oxygen in the right combinations to give us the same kind of sea level atmosphere that we have down here on the earth. So it really didn't smell, really didn't smell much at all. And that goes to you guys, we talked about on Monday, Apollo 13, and that's what they had to fix is that they had to figure out a way to make those two things work and get that carbon dioxide out or less it would be very toxic to those people. I have heard other astronauts say that it, they, they feel like sometimes space smells like metal. Did that ever occur for you? Any kind of metallic smell? Well, um, it would be, it would be the vehicle that you're smelling. Right. Um, and so, sure, there could be some metallic smell as well, because you are surrounded by, for the most part, it's aluminum um, on the inside of the vehicle. Uh, the panels, the, sw now the switches would be steel. So I suppose there could be somewhat of a, of a metallic smell to it. I don't actually recall that, that too awful much. Uh, but I could see where, where that would be the way some people would perceive it. Sure. And uh, let's see if I can find you. We've got a ton of people. I want Hannah and Max. Let me see if I find your name here. Uh, you guys have got a great question. Let's see. You're, you're fantastic today, and I'm trying to get everybody if they can. I'm not seeing your name, and I'm so darn sorry. Let's see here. I'm going to ask your question, Hannah and Max. They want to know, have you ever met an astronaut that walked on the moon, and if there's a great story they told you? Oh, golly. The answer is yes. I met, in fact, all the moonwalkers that were still alive when I first became an astronaut and over the years, 
um, got to meet got to meet all the moonwalkers that still live because when we first came into the space program, NASA brought back the former astronauts to tell us um, their experiences. And oh golly, one of the of course one of the big experiences was you were walking on a a, a moon it wasn't a planet walking on a moon uh, that only had one sixth the gravity that we have here on the earth. So even though they'd be in a very heavy spacesuit, they could jump pretty high uh, because the gravity is only one sixth and our muscles are sized to handle uh, full gravity. So it was quite the experience for all of them. Now, the, I guess the, the sort of description that they would give of what they saw was Something along the lines of stark desolation is pretty much what what the moon looked like because it's dusty, uh, dusty and dirty uh, where they chose to land. They didn't want to land on boulders or things like that. Uh, so it obviously no trees, no grass, no no living anything um, on the moon. Uh, but what a fantastic experience. They came to NASA and they showed us their movies of their mission. And I have to say the movies of orbiting the moon, flying at a relatively low altitude around the moon. And you could do that because there's no air. Here on the earth, we have to orbit of well above a hundred miles because the air reaches up fairly high. So we've got to be much higher than that around the moon. If you chose to, you could orbit the moon at let's say 10,000 feet above the surface because there's no atmosphere there. So what an experience. When I saw their movies, I said, I'm jealous. I missed out on all that. So really the experience of a lifetime. All right, going over here to, uh, you've had your hand up. I know Victoria, you have, but I'm coming to Tapa Swinney. She's, it's late uh, at night in India, but Tapa Swinney, please ask your question. Um, after the Challenger accident, uh, I heard that you were a part of the team that redesigned and recertified the new solid boosters. So what changes did you make for this? Excellent question. Yes, I was part of the I was part of the investigation of the accident leading up to that point and I was investigating the build of the solid rocket boosters and also the fuel tank, the big orange fuel tank uh, that Challenger had. And looking at how did we put those together down at the Cape? Because one of the questions that we had to answer had been, did we have this accident because we assembled it incorrectly? or was it a design flaw? Was it a design defect? And I learned so much about the booster rockets from doing that, that as a result, I was assigned as the lead astronaut to the redesign effort. So I spent over a year working with the redesign team uh, that included the, the manufacturer, which was Morton Thiokol in Utah, but also all the NASA centers uh, that had an input on the redesign of the booster rockets. And then I got to command the second launch uh, when we started up again. And I have to say the team that worked on this, there's that word team again, the teamwork that went into redesigning those booster rockets made them into such a reliable and robust system that for the remainder of the entire space shuttle program, we had virtually no issues with the booster rockets themselves. Very few anomalies and very few things that we had to investigate. So we did our job properly and we did our job correctly. It was a very painful and difficult time for us because we had just lost seven of our friends. And it was, a, like I say, a very difficult time, but the team really rose to the challenge and did a great job putting everything back together. Great question, great question. All right, Kirsten, uh, I'm gonna unmute you. I see your question. Do you wanna ask your question? You want me to? All right, I'm gonna ask how, her. Oh, go ahead, baby, yes. How do you sleep in space? 
oh, golly, Kirsten, it's great. You can sleep anywhere. Um, <laughs> And my first night in space on my first mission, February the 3rd, 1984, I was one of the last ones to go to bed. And what we had was we had this little cotton sleeping bag. In fact, I should have shown a picture in one of my slides, although, but anyway, we had a little cotton sleeping bag that you would just crawl into and you could attach your sleeping bag anywhere you wanted to. And when it was time for me to go to sleep, I was the last one, all the good spots were already taken. And so I wasn't sure where I was going to sleep. So where did I put my sleeping bag? I put it on the ceiling downstairs and I slept on the ceiling. And now I know that sounds weird, but you can sleep right side up, upside down, sideways, on the ceiling, on the floor, on the walls. You can sleep anywhere because in weightlessness, it all feels the same to you. Now, after that, after that first night, what I started doing, and I did this every other night that I ever spent in space, I slept in my seat. So when I was co-pilot, I slept in the right seat uh, of Challenger upstairs. And then as mission commander, I always slept in my left seat. And that was handy because frequently in the middle of the night, we'd have a, an alarm go off or a, a warning go off. And it was so handy for me because it would wake me up right away but I'm right there where I can bring up a display on the, on the display on the instrument panel, see what the issue is. And frequently I can fix it all by myself and I don't have to wake up anybody else. So I would wind up sleeping in my seat. Now that doesn't sound very comfortable, but you know what? I'm not really sitting down. I'm in my sleeping bag and I put the lap belt around me just loosely like the seat belt in a car, just to keep me from floating away. And so I would sleep right there. I'm not really sitting down. I'm floating in the air above my seat. And so it was actually very comfortable. That is a great question. I'm coming to my friend, uh, Miss uh, Anderson's class in Harlem. Uh, Christina Hernandez, you wanna ask your question? Uh, yeah, so, oh, oh, where'd you go? Uh, I just unmuted you. All right, there you go. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, just let me unmute you. Well, you may have to now try, see if you, see if you can get there. There you go. Okay, whoops. <laughs> All right, go and ask your question. What's your oh, name? My name is Cosmo Hernandez. And did you have to become a Navy pilot to become an astronaut? Well, the answer is you didn't have to be a Navy pilot. You could be an Air Force pilot. You could be a Marine pilot. You could be um, an Army pilot to be an astronaut. You could actually not even be a pilot at all and be an astronaut because we picked a number of people uh, that were not pilots, but they had a scientific background that was important to us. So, for example, Sally Ride the first woman, first American woman in space was not a pilot, but she was an astrophysicist. And that was a scientific background that was important to us. And so you didn't have to be a pilot. Now, we picked a lot of Navy pilots and we had a lot of Navy pilots that flew the shuttle. We also had a lot of Air Force pilots, a lot of Marine Corps pilots. Um, now, flying a vehicle into space, whether it be a space shuttle or whether it be the Soyuz that the Russians fly, involves some flying. So it is very useful to have piloting experience. Now, I wanted to be a space shuttle pilot, so I had to be a military test pilot because uh, we had never picked anyone to be a space shuttle pilot that wasn't a test pilot in the military. So I was fortunate I had just the right background to get selected uh, to be a space shuttle pilot. So great question, really a good question. And Cosmo, I love your background and it's beautiful. I do, I do too, <laughs> I do too. So, the, so your thing is, and this is what I hear now, 
as people are planning to go back to the moon and to Mars and to see if we can grow, plant some things, you know, maybe you become a botanist or a biologist. They're also going to be discovering, much like his wife, Dr. Ray Seddon, when she was on the space shuttle, she was doing a lot of tests about what does microgravity and living in uh, a lessened state of gravity do to the human body. So you can also become an astronaut uh, because of your medical knowledge. Now there is a current gentleman in the uh, astronaut candidate program right now and he's just had, he's had three careers already. He was a Navy SEAL and he's a medical doctor and now he's in the astronaut candidate program. So he was like, I'm gonna cover all my bases. So again, think about whatever those things really kind of light you up and you go, maybe I can do that and also go to space. But having good math and chemistry and physics knowledge and also learn the metric system because that's what scientists are gonna start measuring things in and it's pretty much all over the world. And sometimes it's like, did you ever come up against that hoot? Did you have to kind of like, kind of, were you always converting or found yourself that you really needed to talk in metric terms? I was able to adjust to metric. And of course, you know, the conversion factor is 0 0.3048. So you can convert feet to meters by using 0 0.3048, either multiplying by it or dividing by it, depending on which way you're going. Uh, and then 2.2 pounds per kilogram and things like that. So uh, we did it in college as well. We used the metric system for some of our stuff, although most of it was the English system. So it was uh, pounds and feet and things like that. But it is going to be something in the future. Now, let me say something about careers. Uh, one of the questions I would get was, hey, if I want to be an astronaut, should I be an astronomer? Should I be an astrophysicist? Should I be a biologist? Should I be? And the answer to that is none of the above. What you should be is something that you really enjoy, something that you have a real passion for. So don't pick a career just because you think, well, this is gonna sound good. I'm an astronomer, so therefore I can be an astronaut. No, pick something that you really enjoy because then you are going to be really good at it. And those were the kind of people that we picked to be astronauts, that was, people who had been very successful in their chosen career. So you want to pick something that you really enjoy and that's going to make you the most successful in your career. And therefore we're going to pick you to be an astronaut. So that's what you should be. Oh, I love that. All right, let me kind of like make the rounds here. Victoria, you had your hand up a while ago. I'm going to try to find you here and all of my people. Do you still have that question, my dear? Uh, oh, I saw a hand. I'm going to go back here. Matt Isbell, you, it looks like you guys have a question. Yes, right there. What's your question, sweetheart? <laughs> oh, hi. I thought Lulu's I saw a hand over there. Do you have five. a question, Matt? Lulu's five, and she's really been interested in space. In fact, we made a giant cardboard box spaceship. It's painted to the T. Um, is there something that, that you could tell a five-year-old, uh, Mr. Gibson, that 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 might inspire a young person like this. She, she's a shy right now. So you well, can okay. yes, I, I can see she's being a little bit shy. I wanna see you. Okay, I can just barely see you in the bottom of the picture. <laughs> All right, she's a pretty girl. She's a pretty girl. Well. Um, I guess I'd start off by saying, yeah, you're doing all the things I used to do. I made cardboard spaceships uh, that we take a great big box and cut windows in it and decorate it with crayons on the outside. So, so golly, you're doing the same sorts of things that I did. And I'll bet you probably enjoy the same sorts of things that I did. And I guess it's a little bit early to be saying what you're going to be um, out of college and what you're going to be as a career. But uh, keep doing the exploring and keep doing the discovering. Uh, those were things that I did all my life. And so what you're doing is exactly the right sort of thing. So good luck to you. It looks like we have eyes on you, Victoria. Do you want to ask your question now? Uh, 
What's it like to be in zero gravity? Oh, golly, what's it like to be in zero gravity? Victoria, it is so much fun uh, to be weightless. Weightless is zero gravity, which means we don't have to climb stairs. We don't have to walk anywhere that we go. We just fly everywhere we go. It is so wonderful. Now, at the same time, the experience of being up 200 miles above the earth, just picture the view that gives you. You can see for thousands of miles in every direction. And so the view of the earth is just spectacular, not just in the daytime, but at night as well, because we humans light up the whole world. Uh, cities are lit up at night, highways are lit up, airports are lit up. And so we have this spectacular view of the earth and you never get tired of watching the earth go by from up in space. So just a, just a fabulous experience being weightless. Great question. Ander, you're going to close us out with a last question here. Scoot back. Let's see your face. What's your question, sir? Um, my question is, um, so with like the freeze dried food and the freeze and the powdered drinks and all of that, can you tell us like sort of like what you had and what it tasted like? Like maybe what your menu was. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, starting with, I think it was my third mission, NASA let us pick what we wanted to have. They'd give us a list of here's what's available. And we would go through the whole eight days and say, here's what I want for breakfast the first day. Here's what I want for lunch. Here's what I want for dinner. Now, one of the things that I really liked a lot, it's going to sound yucky, was shrimp cocktail. And shrimp cocktail was dehydrated shrimp in dehydrated cocktail sauce. And what you did was you mixed it with, I'm trying to remember, it was four or six ounces of cold water and then let it rehydrate for about 15 or 20 minutes. And it was really good. In fact, it was so good that I awarded it to myself for every lunch and every dinner uh, when I was up in space. And there weren't any times that I opened up my lunch pack and said, well, I'm not going to eat that today. Uh, there maybe might be something in there that I decided I didn't want to eat, but I always ate the shrimp cocktail. But we had like dehydrated spaghetti and meatballs. We had uh, dehydrated sausage patties for breakfast, dehydrated scrambled eggs. It doesn't sound good, but it was. The food was really good. And so you couldn't go wrong because we did tastings. NASA had us come over to the kitchen uh, where they prepared all the food and they'd actually give us samples of it and let us taste it. So you got to pick out uh, and we kept notes on it. So you wrote down what it was you really liked and what you weren't so crazy about, but it was really good food. And I'm sure what they've done for International Space Station is equally as good. Uh, because it is kind of important. Uh, it's kind of important to have a happy crew. And one of the ways you're happy is if you're eating things that you like. So, so anyway, the food was very good. No complaints whatsoever. Good and question. Hannah, Great question. Yeah. Hannah, uh, why does food have to be dehydrated? And that has a lot to do with payload and weight, correct? Yes. And, and the fact is, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it was just more convenient on space shuttle. And I meant to mention this earlier, because we make water on board. The way we make water is we generated electrical power using fuel cells. We had three fuel cells on the space shuttle and those combine hydrogen with oxygen and that generates electrical power. And the byproduct is H2O. So we made more water than we could ever use. So it saved weight for us to carry dehydrated or dried food and then just mix it with the water that we make every day on orbit. So that's why it was so convenient on shuttle station. They don't use fuel cells. So you wouldn't have the same benefit uh, coming from a fuel cell and water and dehydrated food.
I know that Lucas, I see your hand. Tynan, I see your hand. Could you send me a quick question in chat? And I'm going to see if uh, we can answer this quickly. So send those to me quickly in a chat if you can. And last words, and we'll see what these questions are and see if we can ask them real quickly. But any last words to these future space lovers? And then before we go, guys, we'll all say thank you to Astronaut Hoot and Miss Anderson. I've got a gift to send you for uh, one of your students on this morning that might finish a challenge over the weekend. So stick around for that as well. But any last words to these potential future astronauts, aerospace workers we have on the call today? Well, yes. And, and you know, I was blessed. I was lucky growing up uh, as I showed pictures of mom and dad to grow up in a flying family. And so there had always been a focus and an emphasis. My father was an aeronautical engineer and I knew that I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. My mother was a teacher. And so I had a background uh, from my family that really prepared me to go into naval aviation and test pilot and astronaut. And not everyone has that out of mom and dad. So it's wonderful that Janet's planet exists to help expose young people to the wonders of aviation and science and space flight. So Janet, keep up the great work. Thank you. Well, I just wanna tell everybody that it's like, I'm so thrilled so many of you joined us this morning. Truly Hoot is such a dear, good friend that I can call upon and ask, will he come and talk to my students? Uh, and, uh, a couple of questions that are coming in. What, how does it feel like? Uh, so Tynan, if this, I'm gonna ask you to go back and rewatch about that because Hoot does talk about what that feeling is, leaving Earth's atmosphere. He's, you said 17,500 miles an hour, right? Is that that's, what, that's, that's correct. how you're traveling fast. And then once you break free the bonds of Earth's gravity after eight and a half minutes, whoo, you're floating, right? All of a sudden, you go from three Gs of acceleration to zero Gs, and everything's floating. The wires and the cables that are in the cockpit are floating. Your checklist, if you just had it not stuck down on the Velcro, your checklist would be floating next to you. So yeah, it's an exciting transition. So guys, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Yes, uh, after Hoot left the space program, he flew uh, for Southwest Airlines for 20 years. So he loved flying so much. They have written a story that there's pretty much not a plane that he hasn't tried out or flown. And you still race, right? Are you still racing airplanes? Well, actually, no, I still fly racing airplanes, but I haven't flown in the air races uh, for a couple of years now. and. Maybe it was time for me to retire from it. I was getting a little older. Um, in fact, they tell me I'm the oldest person that ever won the unlimited championship. So uh, I had 18 years of air racing and survived it. And so maybe it was time for me to step down. I wasn't doing it willingly, but uh, I didn't get invited back to race uh, after that. And so I haven't raced since uh, 2015, but I still fly racing airplanes. And I tell you what, guys, if you want to learn more, you can Google Robert Hoot Gibson. And if a guy in a cowboy hat shows up, not the right person. That was a Western actor. So you may want to put astronaut in there. So here is... Excuse me? Yes. Um, also, um, adding on to the question about how you, like, rehydrate the food, um... Is it only on the ISS that they recycle urine and turn it into water, or is that on the space shuttles too? It's, it's only on the ISS. Now, I think they were doing it on the Russian space station as well, but yes, it was only on the International Space Station, so we didn't do that on the, on the space shuttles. We didn't quite have the technology at that point. Good question. So Good question, but we're going to wrap up here. So to Miss Jenna's class, if you will write a couple of paragraphs and do some research 
on astronaut Hoot Gibson and the space shuttle program. I am going to send you guys a book by a scientist that we heard from just the other day. This is Tanya, Dr. Tanya Harrison's book for all mankind, uh, for all humankind, I should say. And I will send this to you, Miss Anderson, and you get to pick a worthy person who might want this book, all right? Or you can tell me who you want me to send it to. And I see several worthy uh, uh, worthy candidates there on your thing. So guys, we'll be back next Monday. And Monday's gonna be great. We're gonna have Miss Rachel Tillman talking to us about the history of Mars Viking uh, rovers and things that were there on Mars. Next week is just again, another fantastic week. We're gonna have a female astronaut next Thursday, astronaut Wendy Lawrence. On that day, the time may change just a little bit because she lives out on the West Coast and it would be terribly early uh, to get her up. So we're gonna just know that Thursday's time may change, but I'm gonna unmute you all and you guys are all gonna say thank you to astronaut Hoot. Hoot you are a dear friend and I am so grateful for you. Hug Dr. Ray for me. I'm unmuting everybody. Let's say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for Yes, yes, Lucas. I hear you. What is that, Lucas? I see you, Lucas. All right. What was your question, my love? Um, I sent it in the chat, but it I, was for Hoot that I asked him, "Have you ever been to New Jersey?" Have you ever been to New Jersey? I think Hoot has logged off now, my sweet. He has because when he was flying uh, commercially for Southwest Airlines, is that right, Hoot? Had well, you yes, then, and I, I also flew uh, the NASA jets into, into New Jersey now and then. So yes, I've been to New Jersey many, many times. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you're persistent, Lucas. <laughs> yes, Lu yes. Lucas was in- um, I got a question. Have you been- have you been here past 2013?